Hey guys, it's Tiny Tom Logan back with another video for you and today we're going to talk all things 14th gen. I'm not sure why they needed an NDA for this in reality, uh, but there we go. One of the things I would like to say really early on is, yes, this is the CPU review, but I have a lot of motherboard reviews uh, live on the channel as well, if you would like to go and take a look. So we've got motherboard reviews uh, on the website, brand new website, Mobile Works. Uh, you can all zoom in and it's just lovely and hopefully it's a nicer place for you to be uh, if you're still on your desktop as well. But uh, Maximus Dark Hero, full review. Uh, MSI Ace Max, full review. Uh, then we also have uh, Z790 Aorus Pro X, full review. There are previews live for all of the boards, including on the channel, the uh, new formula and the Apex Encore. The reason why I've not done reviews of the Formula and the Apex Encore for launch is because uh, the memory that was meant to have arrived, I won't mention names, uh, but hasn't arrived, it's got caught up in customs. Um, so it's, it's unfortunate, but I wanted to put some 8,000 megahertz plus memory through these, and uh, so I'm waiting for that to arrive so that we can do a proper job. Now, three processors. I have the i5, the i7, and the i9. Yes, I do have the i7. Uh, it wasn't sent by Intel, but I managed to sneakily get one. Uh, it fell off the back of a lorry. So I have that to talk to you about today. Now, the i5 is six P cores, eight E cores, and it goes up to 5.3 gigahertz. And yes, I do have notes. The reason why I have notes is I don't script. This is just a humongous brain fart. Uh, the i7, 8p cores and 12 e cores. Now they've upped the e cores on the i7. It's the one change out of all of the processors in reality uh, that's going to make a um, remarkable difference. And by that I mean the other processors are kind of clock speed changes, whereas the i7's actually got extra cores. Now they will on the i7 run at 5.5 gigahertz all core, but you'll occasionally see two flick up to 5.6 and it, it they're always kind of different so it will work out which one of the strongest ones are and you will uh, see those flick up that extra 100 megahertz the i9 8 p cores 16 e cores it says 5.8 but in reality i was seeing mine at 5.7 all core more often than not and then you will get the two flash up to 6 gigahertz again the same sort of thing with the um uh, i7 now I do want to talk about temperatures and voltages very early on because it is very important. Now I have tested the boards with the i9. We always have done it this way. We take the strongest processor at launch and then we test all of the other boards with it um, uh, rather than kind of like testing with an i7 for example. We always use the i9 as kind of at that point in time the best case scenario. But the voltages that all of the boards have been using on the i9 are much higher than it really needs uh, and that in tow then means you've got incredibly incredibly hotter temperatures than are really required or necessary now i test with the corsair h170 and when we did the i9 thermals the first round that we did even with the h170 on 100% fans we were still hitting 100 degrees it was at that moment I was like I am not testing this processor like this with all of the boards all the time I need to see if I can undervolt it and I got it running at 1.3 volts 100% stable in every benchmark the only one that was falling over was uh, Cinebench 24, which it needed 1.3 volts. All of the other benchmarks could run at 1.25 volts. So I needed that extra bump in uh, volts just to keep Cinebench 24 happy. It was quite weird, uh, but that's it. It's just because of the AVX instructions in it. It needed the extra, the grunt. If you were gaming, you probably wouldn't need above 1.25 volts. It's the same with the i7. The i7, uh, for an undervolt, I took it from 1.41, I think, the Strix was putting through it because I've tested the processors all on the Strix. Um, again, that's a fairly common thing for me. Um, I could have done the formula. I could have used the Apex, and I think Asus would have preferred if I did. 
but I always kind of go to the middle of the pack, Strix board, because I think if you're going to spend that much money on a board, you should be able to put an i9 in it comfortably. And then it also, what it does give me, is the ability that when I do go in later on and use the stronger board to see if it really does make any difference. But anyway, uh, i7, I got it undervolted from 1.41, which was flicking up occasionally, down to 1.2 volts for the majority of tests. It wanted 1.25 for... Um, uh, no, it didn't. I tell a lie. I tell a lie. It was 1.2 for the undervolt, 100% stable. But then I managed to get, and that was with the um, clock speeds, like I said, at stock, which is 5.5, with the occasional one going up to 5.6. At 1.25 volts, I could get all core running at 1.25 volts. Um, all core 5.6. So effectively, I managed to overclock the i7 at lower volts than it was trying to put in it at stock. Now, I, uh, I haven't tested this, the i7 on every board, as in done a swathe of benchmarks, but the i7 and the i5 have gone in every one of the boards I've tested just so that I could double check the voltages, and they were all pretty much the same. Uh, the i5, it was only about 1.25 volts at stock anyway, and the temperatures were great at that as well. I still managed to turn it back down a little bit, but in reality, the, um, the best bit about the i5 is it will overclock. So 1.25 volts, actually got all core running at 5.7. It is, for me, the one that was the most rewarding processor to work with, you didn't have to worry about thermals. You don't have to uh, delete it if you don't want to, but heck, you might even be able to go even further. I'd love to be able to see with a smidgen more volts whether we could even push that process that little bit further. But I'll show you the graphs just so that you can see that just by uh, undervolting that i9, we took 20 degrees off the temps. It's that important. I've said it many times in the past, I have kind of lost my way with the stuff that's happened, but I am going to do an undervolting guide for every brand. I know that's only three, but I'm still gonna do separate ones just so I can show you the BIOS, where to go, how to do it, how to set the load line calibration up properly, because none of them really work properly out of the box. It's just annoying. Um, it, weirdly, if I was to pick the board that was the happiest out of the box, it was the MSI, but weirdly as well, the MSI was hottest. Even though it was running less volts, it was consistently hotter than all of the other boards. And if you want to go and have a look at thermals and specific board reviews, please head over to the website. <coughs> so as I've stated, um, I wanted to do uh, main reviews for the Formula and for the Apex and probably the Master as well for launch, as in full reviews. But there's been a hiccup with customs and I've got some very fast memory en route and uh, it's basically being held by customs and has caused me no end of uh, headaches trying to sort it. So the full reviews for those will be coming later and we will give it a full breakdown. Now, when we look at performance, I'm going to move out of the way, but what I'm also going to do is just ping the graphs up so that you can have a look. Please remember though that you can go and have a look on the OC3D website if you would like to go and have a look at more graphs, if you would like to pick apart the graphs, spend a little bit more time absorbing them. You could pause the video now, go onto the website, find it, zoom in on the graph and be able to decipher them that little bit better. It might help you, I don't know. The problem with uh, my graphs are, people always moan that you can't see them, but at the same time we put an awful lot of information in them for you as well so that there are many comparisons it's not just two or three cpus a couple of back tested ones we've got data it's just there's reams of it which is why we try and share so much of it with you now as you've seen <coughs> the i7 has had a really big decent step forward and that's those cores the i9 and we're pretty much into a uh conclusion at this point even though there's still graphs going up but we are still pretty much into a conclusion the i9 to me is 
a 13900 KS in disguise. It will just about pip it at the post in most things, but only just. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, I've got 13th gen. Do I need to upgrade to 14th gen? If you're going to go 5 to 5 or uh, 7 to 7 or 9 to 9, then no. Um, I'd question your life choices if you're upgrading from a 12 and like 5 to 5, 7 to 7 or 9 to 9. But if you are going to go from a 5 to a 9, you're obviously throwing in loads of extra cores. And what you do also have to think about here is... I don't, most people are going to have a power supply that's going to be able to cope with uh, these processors. Um, <clears throat> but the thing to think about in reality is if you're going into DDR5, it's going to be the, the uh, broader spectrum of upgrades because you're going to need a new board and you're going to need new memory. But in reality, the thing for me with these is going to be the cooler. And you are going to need to invest heavily in a cooler. You're also going to need to also follow my undervolting guide and use it for your board so that you can drop your temperatures down. It will help you no end long term to bring your um, temps down and then you're not going to have any worry. Well, you're going to have less worries anyway. Um, I will say though that uh, if you're thinking of the 7 or the 9, even with an undervolt, an AIO is going to be a bare minimum. Uh, unless you're planning on undervolting it and underclocking it at the same time. Uh, I don't think that if you don't want to go deaf that many air coolers will be able to keep up. Uh, and, and that's like, even with the cooler that I have in this, it needed 100% fans to be able to keep the thing happy. I think for uh, the most part, if you're going to be gaming with a decent AIO and you've got cans on, you'll be able to get away with it. But if you want to overclock, if you want to have good temperatures, I do think a lot of you are going to need to look at dedicated water cooling and maybe even, like I said, maybe a D-lid. Uh, there are people out there that talk about lapping, but the, the temperatures that can be uh, dropped by lapping aren't really worth the effort. Even if you do like properly get the faces mated, you then have to play with the cooler base as well. I would just go D-lid. <coughs> But like I said, that's the extreme end of the market um, and you do need to go very careful with your blocks and your mounting. Um, so, very hot. Definitely can save yourself some temperatures with undervolts. Bit of a sidestep with the i9, it's pretty not much a KS. The i7 does get the extra cores though, so you get a nice boost from that. But in reality, for me, the one that I had most fun with, the most rewarding overclocking with, Decent volts, decent temperatures, decent performance, decent overclocking was the i5. So, deep breaths. Some disappointment, some quite fun stuff, some many lots of hot stuff. But please, 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 let me know what you thought in the comments. Are you going to buy it? What would you team it up with? What board do you want? Don't forget that there will be more stuff on the website, more stuff on the channel. But for now, this has been a very dry-throated Tiny Tom Logan uh, with another video for you. Out. Ding! Love you, sis.